Um, so we're going to call the next speaker as Dr. Antonio Rodriguez. Dr. Rodriguez is a reproductive medicine specialist who co-founded Medfirm, Medfirm Fertility Clinic. Tony is an expert and leader in minimally invasive surgery. He has a special interest in time, agency, perfectionism, stress, and its influence on fertility. He also co-developed an online self-help interactive stress management program and has published internationally and co-authored chapters in books in the fields of hyperinsulism in male fertility and stress and its role in infertility. So if, if you undergo IVF, um, what are the chances of you having recurrent failed IVF? And if we look worldwide, it's around about 10%. So if we take all the patients we get, 10% of them will have recurrent failed IVF. So it's a very small group, and that group obviously gets worse with age. So the older you are, the more likely you are to fit into that group. So we're not talking every IVF, we're talking a small group of people doing IVF, and I just want to emphasize that. So how do we define this? And this is really not 100% defined in the world. But from our point of view at Medfem, we go with a general feeling that if you've had three failed embryo transfers with high quality embryos, and in our opinion, going again with the American um, Fertility Society, we take three tested normal embryos, and I'll, I'll elaborate on that. So you can have an, an embryo that looks fantastic, it's graded well, but unless you actually do pre-genetic testing and assess whether the embryo is normal or not, you don't know if it's chromosomally normal. And I'll expand on that as we talk. Or, and this is important, more than 10 embryos if you're over the age of 35, and if you're under 35, it's basically seven embryos. And why is it that? First of all, I just want to mention on the implantation side, if you've, done, if you've tested embryos, and you've got three tested embryos, you will end up with a 92.6% pregnancy rate, so, which is very high, but those are in tested normal embryos. If your embryos aren't tested, you actually don't know whether they're normal or not. They can look beautiful, they can be graded the best grade, but you don't know if they're chromosomally normal. So what has to happen? for this magic implantation to take place. The first thing is you need a high quality blastocyst, and obviously if that's a tested blastocyst and the chromosomes are normal, that's the highest quali quality blastocyst you can get. And that's a day five embryo. It consists of an outer cell uh, mass which creates the placenta and an inner cell mass which creates the baby. The next thing that happens, it actually hatches, and that happens often when we, before we do the transfer, it starts to hatch. So that's the next phase in development. And then three important things take place. The first is it needs to come close to the lining of the uterus. It has to get to the lining of the uterus. The second thing, it needs to attach to that lining, and we'll, come, we'll go through that in a bit more detail. And then the last thing that needs to happen, it actually has to invade that, that lining of the uterus. So it has to penetrate that lining to make a space for itself and to grow as an embryo. So there's a lot taking place there. And within the context of my talk today, it's any of those things can go wrong. And we as fertility specialists um, have to, uh, from my point of view, we need to do that almost all the testing before we do IVF. So we limit the number of people going through recurrent failures try and answer the questions before you get the problem. Um, but sometimes we have, you can only answer it once you know what the embryos are like and you, you have to go through more than one cycle. So why does IVF mostly fail? It's because the embryo is not normal. And the other thing is, even if you do pre-genetic testing and you have a chromosomally normal embryo, it doesn't mean it's actually normal. There are other things in an embryo which we can't measure. And those things are genetics between the couple. That's quite rare. Problems with what we call microdeletions and other things. So if you, and that is why, to get a 95% chance of having a baby with a tested embryo, you need at least three. 
So some patients will fall pregnant with the first one, others will fall pregnant with the second, and the last with the third. And that, just to mention that, when you're going through IVF and someone puts an embryo back, and we in our practice like to put one embryo back at a time because of the complication rates with twin pregnancies. So if we're putting one embryo back and it doesn't work, and we put a second and it doesn't work, the last one has a much higher chance of being the right embryo. So your chances go up with your embryos. Not like everyone thinks, well, I've made bad embryos, so none of them are going to work. It actually goes up. So just something to put in your heads. If you're going through IVFs, give it a chance. It does come right. So what's this all about? Dr. Beaker mentioned it. Age is the most important thing. Unfortunately, we can't change age. So the younger you are, the better the quality of the eggs. If we look at the, this curve, what is interesting in the 22 to 25-year-olds, their abnormality rate in embryos is actually higher. And there's two reasons for that. Often those patients have very high egg, uh, egg uh, numbers, and a lot of their embryos land up being not normal. And also that group of people, their lifestyles aren't always in a good space. We can't change age, we can't change whether the embryo is abnormal to start with, but there is no doubt that as, you de as an embryo develops, as an egg develops in the cycle, it can go from a normal egg to an abnormal egg, depending on the environment that we're going to discuss a little bit about. So a normal egg can become an abnormal egg, and they've showed this where they've gone and done chromosomes on normal eggs versus embryos, and they found that, in fact, there's a much lower rate of abnormals compared to abnormal embryos. So the important thing here, and that's a lot of the talk, is what can we do other than age, having babies younger, um, making sure that you understand if you're a couple having your babies younger. But as you as a group, you're already in this situation. You're not in that group of preventing fertility problems later. This is also an important slide, and, and again, uh, Dr. Beaker did, it came out in his talk. If we look, as you get older, well, I think the first thing, I started doing IVF in 1990, so that's a long time ago. So I've grown with this, and, and those were the success rates. They were hardly anything, less than 10% in those days. The six, and this is live birth rates, by the way, so if you're pregnant, and how, how often will you have a baby being born? Because that's the only critical thing. Being pregnant, having a positive test, having a heartbeat is, is important, but we want a live birth, a healthy baby in your arms. That's the end goal for us. And if you look at this, this is actually stable at the moment. It's, it's around just over 30% in your under 35-year-olds. As soon as you go down there, you can see how it drops. And that's purely a reflection that age creates a problem with the chromosomes, the number of normal eggs that have normal chromosomes. And unfortunately, there's not much you can do about that. So what can we do? And look, I've, I've, over the last 30 years, we've been very focused on lifestyle changes in our practice, in our, in our research that we do. And these are the factors that play a role. So BMI is important, and you've heard about it, can be low BMIs, high BMIs. There are some people with high BMIs that are very fertile. They've got absolutely normal uteruses, they make great eggs, and they make babies easily. But once you get into this recurrent failed IVF, both men and women need to put the effort in to these things. Being on the right diet. Even if you need to go on to uh, uh, dietary therapy in some patients to reduce your weight, we're talking about a very specific group here, people who have recurrent failed in vitros. They need to pay attention to this. In my opinion, this should be paid attention to before you do your first IVF. But if you have already gone through in vitros and any of these are pertinent to you, smoking, we know, is a vasoconstrictor. It constricts the blood vessels. And it's a problem for the uterus, for the egg quality. It's real. You need to cut your smoking if you can. Drinking, again, drinking is a problem. Stress for me is the biggest problem. I mean, we've been talking about stress for um, 25 years now. 
And if any of you, if any of you want to see a few stressed, you can go onto our that website, www.tups.co. There's a free, you can do it for free. And you, I think you can download our book, which we wrote 25 years ago, called Faster, Better, Sicker. That's what it was all about. If you read that book, it sounds like everything that's coming out in the world now in terms of stress is in that particular book that we wrote a long time ago. The other thing is, I made a point of putting men and women, because this is not a female thing. This is a male as, uh, situation as well. Can men influence the quality of the embryo? Absolutely. A sperm that fertilizes an egg needs to be a healthy sperm, with the right BMR, without smoking, all those factors play a role in the sperm. And you can get an embryo that you think's fine, and we blame the egg, and it can be the sperm. So guys, you need to be on board with this. In terms of hormones, we always test all the men as well. We want to know that they don't have high insulin levels, that their thyroids are normal, and that they don't have high prolactin levels. Exactly the same as a female. If they've got any of that wrong, we need to correct it before we do IVF. And then lastly, you need to optimize your nutrient intake. And different clinics use different nutrients, and you've got to trust the fertility specialist that you're with. The people that are around are all good doctors, and you've just got to have your faith in the doctor that you're with. And, and, and understand what they're saying and understand their philosophies. Um, in terms of that, I'm not going to go into detail. In our clinic, we use Insumax Q and uh, we use Staminogray in the men. We use active folic acid. Those are the kind of things we do. It's the only time that one plus one equals one. It's this time. You need that to be healthy, men and women, to create a healthy embryo. And that you can change. So it's something you can change. You have heard all about this this morning. You need to fix all these things. You need to fix fibroids. If they are playing a role where they're close to the lining of the uterus, they take away the blood supply and they need to be removed. If you have polyps in the uterus, they need to be removed. If there are little, we call them adhesions, little strings of tissue that are interrupting the uterus, they need to be removed. You saw that earlier, where people have walls in the uterus. That needs to be dealt with before you go through your IVF program. Endometriosis, in, in modern opinion, latest opinion, it's been up and down endometriosis. From our point of view at Menfem, we know that that plays a big role in egg quality, can play a role in egg numbers, and can play a role in implantation. So if you've got recurrent failed IVF and, you've never, and you have never had um, a laparoscopy, that's part of the management. And it's amazing how many women don't have one symptom of endometriosis. And yet when you do the operation, they've got stage three or four disease. So it is something that you've got to consider. There's some new work that's come out now that there's an association with the bacteria in the uterus that, that they saying causes endometriosis. I don't buy that, but I mean it's fair. But women who have endometriosis have a higher chance of having this bacteria in the uterus. And it's all to do with your immune system that you get these things. And that's why we've been big on stress. Stress is one of the biggest factors in depleting immune systems and creating a problem in the environment with egg quality and with implantation. Adenomyosis is having endometriosis in the muscle, and if the adenomyosis or the fibroids are close to the lining, then you're going to get a problem with implantation. What is important, the embryo doesn't go into the muscle. It sits above the muscle on a, what we call a basal layer. So if you've got a clear margin all the way around that basal layer, you'll be fine. You don't have to have major surgery. We've got patients with severe adenomyosis. But if it's around the lining, it's going to cause a problem. I think they spoke about um, tubes that are blocked. If your tube is blocked and it's blocked at the end, right at the end here, that becomes a problem. And you can imagine that's filled with fluid. And the fluid goes back into the uterus and kills off the embryo. To the degree that if you've got an open tube on the other side and you're battling to fall pregnant, often if you remove that tube, and that's the only problem, the patient will actually fall pregnant naturally. 
because that other tube is still working and it's been, the embryo has been influenced by the toxicity of that. How is this diagnosed? By ultrasound and HSG, which is an X-ray of the, of the fallopian tubes and uterus. Hysteroscopy is very important and laparoscopy is very important. And those things need to be done in context of, of IVF as a general principle. So what can we do when you've had a number of failed IVFs? IVF is actually an experiment or an investigation in whether you can make an embryo. We don't know that as doctors. We can do all the preparation, but until we've got the embryo, we actually haven't got a clue whether it's going to be fine or not. So if we look at that and we've done a stimulation and we get poor em embryos out of it or poor eggs, we then have to go back to the drawing board and then make it specific to that patient, change the stimulation, think about what can get us a better outcome. So uh, recurrent failed IVFs, can we improve egg quality? Yes, if we pay attention to how we, how we stimulate that particular patient. So unfortunately, some people have to go through that to get to the next IVF. It's just one of those things. Assisted hatching, we believe in it. it uh, this will improve it. It's very specific in our practice. We do it on patients over a certain age, over 38, on a fresh transfer, where we're using a fresh embryo. And we do it on all our frozen embryos. Again, it's important that you've got to have your trust in the doctor that you're looking at. All the specialists in town know what they're doing. There's so much in our world of medicine. What works for our practice works for our practice, and we stick with that. So it sounds a bit strange, that, but there's lots of different ways of getting to the end point, and you just have to have that trust in the people that look after you. And then pre-genetic testing, which means the following. On day five, when you've got a blastocyst, which I showed you earlier, outside mass of placental tissue, a biopsy is done by the laboratory staff. They take about six to eight cells out. Those cells are prepared in a special way, and they go to a genetic laboratory for assessment of all, um, well, it's basically all the chromosomes. So it's 46 chromosomes. They're 22, and then you've got your XY chromosome, male, female. And they test for everything at that level. And that particular test will come back, and then we put back an embryo that is normal. Again, that you don't have to do that. This, we're talking about recurrent, recurrent fails, IVFs. Pre-genetic testing, we recommend often to people as they get older. If you look at women under the age of 35, they've got such a good pregnancy rate generally, you don't have to go to tested embryos in that group. What about embryo transfer from a recurrent failure? Do you do fresh transfers? Do you do frozen? Again, in, a, in our particular clinic, we, we have a specific protocol that we follow. Fresh and frozen are the same if you're very choosy about when you put a fresh embryo back. There's certain parameters that we use, and if we use those parameters and it says you shouldn't put it back, then you need to wait for a frozen. Otherwise, they, they're equal in our practice. Having said that, some patients do better with fresh than frozen. You can struggle with frozen embryos, and when you change to a fresh embryo transfer, they do fine. And then what about preparation of the uterus? When we prepare a uterus to put an embryo back, there's two ways of doing it, and there's an in-between way. The one is we use a natural cycle, where the patients, you, you, you monitor their cycle, they have an egg, the egg gets released, and then you use the environment that that egg makes to, to actually create... Um, the, the natural environment for that embryo versus where we just give them estrogen, prepare the uterus. Technically, the, the natural cycle is the better cycle generally to, to transfer embryos. And in, again, we like, especially in tested embryos, to try and use a natural cycle if we can. Now you're going to get into the phase of what about all these other things that people talk about. There is a group of patients that get... Um, uh, they have a higher chance of having clots. It's usually a genetic thing. They often have a family history of having clots in the legs or pulmonary embolus. That's a very specific group of patients, and it's a very specific, specific set of um, tests that need to be done. And it's not for everyone. 
If you're having recurrent miscarriages, that's a good test to do because that does cause recurrent miscarriages. And in this group, we have the ability to give them blood thinners to actually help implantation. Again, in our practice, we have a protocol. Every patient gets uh, Ecotrin during the IVF. Um, we've done it for years. Is it something that's going to make a difference? It's, we use it, and we feel it makes a difference. You don't have to use it. it but it's something that, because we're not using it on a diagnosis basis, we use it routinely. And we use it right up until 12 weeks. And if the fetal medicine specialist thinks it needs to go on right for the rest of the pregnancy, they tell us that at the end of the day. So what about, again, you're going to read a lot of this, and, and there's, a, there's a lot going on to allow our embryo to implant. This is all immune factors that are, are allowing an embryo to implant. If you think about it, that embryo is made up of half of someone else. So it's actually a foreign body in, in that uterus. And in order for that foreign body to implant, it needs blocking, we'll call them blocking antibodies that surround it. They are called blocking antibodies, but it's a complicated immune reaction that says, okay, there are male genes here that I'm picking up, how do I protect this baby? And that's, in that group, there's a very specific group of people who have a problem with this. They have higher natural killer cells. They have a thing called tumor necrosis factor in the uterus. And again, these are treatable by immunotherapy. And from a doctor's point of view, you can use cortisone. You would have read about uh, immunoglobulins and intralipids. From our practice, we like to use immunoglobulins. We use it under the skin instead of intravenous. It has the same benefit. Intralipids, excuse me, are, are used wild, widely. This is for recurrent failures, but in our opinion, again, one can test by doing antithyroid antibodies, antinuclear antibodies, and antiphospholipid antibodies. 15% of our patients come up positive when they present to our practice. So we'd like to do that up front and then give them the prophylactic treatment on their first IVF. What about endometrial receptivity? Can we actually improve how this uterus um, allows the embryo to implant other than the immune therapy? The frozen thought embryo transfer, um, that's basically some of the work suggests that frozen is better during that time. We've got specific criteria for it. We like embryo glue. We've used it for a long time. The studies show um, that it, you, we have an increased pregnancy rate with it. It's not a glue. It's a culture medium that hyperstimulates the area, hyperstimulates stem cells, changes some of the immunity, and allows that embryo to implant. It's not the sticky thing that, we, you, that you put in and it sticks, and, and then it's happy for, for nine months. It's not that. Nice name, but... But patients just wonder how you can you please glue my embryo? You know, I wish we could. <laughs> Plated rich plasma it can take your blood and we can create plasma. Again, we not we not specifically doing that, but there is studies to show that if that uh, that can be used in the uterus, and in patients who've got a very thin lining and you can't get it right, it can be used for that. My personal feeling is if someone's got a thin lining. And unless it's got damage, you should get it right naturally and you'll have a better outcome. That's just our philosophy. If, why is it not right? Putting that in is not going to change why it's not right. And then there's something called granulocyte colony stimulating factor. It's again a product that is showing good results in patients if they have it, um, if you're struggling with it and very specific diagnosis for that specific person. And then the last one, which is quite trendy at the moment, is called the ERA test. Endometrial receptivity assay. It was developed by a, um, a genetic, genetic company. What they do is the, a biopsy is done after seven days of the patient being on progesterone, and they're sent off for a genetic profile, and they'll tell you whether you're putting it back on the right day or whether you need to put it back one day later or one day um, earlier. The studies, the recent studies on that, 
if you haven't had more than two failures, you're wasting your time doing that test. It's not going to change your outcome. So it's, it's designed for recurrent failed IVFs. The other thing, that, um, the other thing about it, it's, it's not cheap, and the pickup rate is not very high. Obviously, if you're the person with the problem, it'll play a role. So it is something there, it is something that we do, but it's very specific on who we do it with on. The last one is called microbiomes. So in the uterus, you have these microbiomes. There's a thing called lactobacillus in women, a very important bacteria that protects the vagina, protects the cervix, and protects the uterus. And that, if that goes out of balance, it allows bacteria into the uterus, and those bacteria then will prevent implantation. There are, there are ways of measuring it, and the treatment's simple. It's antibiotic therapy. So, and you can often pick that up on a hysteroscopy when you're looking. So even if you have that primary hysteroscopy, the doctor will see that there's inflammation in that uterus. You can actually see that something's wrong, and you can treat right up front. So, my last set, so what's, what must we do? Well, I think the first thing you must do is trust the doctor that you're with, or the group of doctors that you're with. That's why you're there. And each one has their own thought process, and you need to go with it. If you look at the statistics, it's not the doctor's fault that it's not working. It's mostly the embryo's fault. And if you manage it, most people land up with a baby of their own. If we're struggling with egg quality and you can't get it right, you can use a donor egg. It sounds foreign, but with counselling and care, people use donor eggs. 30% of our practice is donor eggs because of, we have a high group of women over the age of 38. So those things are available to you. And uh, I suppose my big message is just stay with hope and uh, you will achieve a baby. Thank you. This is the story of baby Lindy and all the times we've been there for her. We were there in the beginning. And when it became official. Baby, congratulations. We were there for mom every day. We were there when big sister to be did There's this. Like three beads, she's been. Beads two. It's two beads. When dad did this. Cheers, madame. And when this happened, we were there too. So here we are. Baby Lindy will be born in exactly 10 minutes. Which is why we've organized an ambulance. Just read that. To help get them to the hospital on time. We were there for Baby Lindy. And we will be there for you. <laughs>